Hello, welcome to Sage Budget Brewers. I'm Tim, and tonight I'm gonna going to discuss the control conundrum. But before we get started, please check out our Discord and our Patreon. Links are in the description below. And if you like our and if you like our content, please hit that like, share, subscribe. It really helps out a lot. And tonight I am joined by my buddy Cole, aka Thunder Farts, and a zombie aficionado, the Mono Blue Man himself. How you doing, Cole? I'm doing well tonight. I don't know if uh, the Mono Blue Man himself is a good title anymore, but I appreciate it none- nonetheless. <laughs> I mean, you still really like a zombie, okay? Let's be honest. Yeah, that's true. I, 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 was, I dumped too much money into that deck, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, honestly, I'm a big... Bra- like, I use the Rock Brawl, and my favorite all-time commander forever is Kami of the Crescent Moon. Mm-hmm. Oh, gosh. Yeah. Yeah, 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 I used to play a lot of Holly Mines, and it, but it, I made it work because I would clog everybody's hand up, and it didn't matter how many cards they drew if they could not cast nothing. Right? Yeah, that's true. Yeah. So, well, so since this, so I brought Cole on because you know he's played a lot of Mono Blue in his day, thus he's very, very, very versed in control or the control archetype, and. I just kind of thought that I've been having some thoughts on the classic, like what we've been calling like archetypes in multiplayer and in commander and in CDH. And I've been kind of finding that the more and more I've kind of been pontificating about it or thinking about it, the more and more I've been kind of finding it wanting kind of lacking and not very accurate. Right. So like for those of you who don't know a control deck generally is a term for a 60 card deck in 1v1 that aims to control opponent's cards and progression with the end result where one has full control of everything during the game, right? You typically do this by engaging in a card advantage, soft locks, and efficient win cons. So back in the olden days, you would do things like cast, have a bunch of counter spells, a bunch of removal, a bunch of sweepers, and then you would finish them off with like, Sierra Angel and Mistress Factories or Morphling was another classic win con. Later on, it came out to be like Tarmogoyf, so on and so on and so forth. So, Cole. Now, I know that you're kind of a a, a big Azami fan. What 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 are what are your thoughts on control in the current meta? All of my opinions are going to be purely from a, I want to say, viewing it from the ass, viewing it from the point of trying to do well in a tournament. Because I feel that you can do well at a at any general meta, but like, I don't really think I feel like doing well against people that are really good in your meta is one thing, but doing well in a tournament where there are actual results is a different thing. Yeah, And just because I feel like that's way easier to, like, kind of quantify and give us a better idea of what to look for, I'm, I'm going to view it in the terms of a, a tournament. Oh, I think, yeah, perfectly. Yeah. I think that when we're looking at uh, control in a tournament setting, the archetype really struggles. I would agree, like, for sure. And, you know, like, I, th- I, I think this is very common. This is, like, a, like... Everybody's going to say right now that, like, your biggest issue is going to be just closing out the game within 75 or 90 minutes because you, you as a control deck, want the game to go long, but that doesn't always mean you're going to be able to close out the game. And oftentimes you might find that you're going to just go 0 3 or 0 4 and you're not going to get to top 16. You're going to just end up not doing the best. Well, so, like, for me, I don't know if you watched my stacks video at all. I kind of talked about like the turn and pacing of commander, especially CD yeah. right now and how like an average game is like five to six turns. Yeah. So I have found like, particularly like in these control decks, like be it stacks or be it like permission based control or stack control. Mm-hmm. You, you, you really like, you don't have enough time to accrue that card advantage that you're wanting to really gain mm-hmm. leverage over your opponents. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. e- e- even if I cast a board wipe and I get three to six creatures, th- that's a great three to one, three, v- you know, three for one or six for one. But 
like I, there's always going to be one or two decks in my pod that like doesn't care about their creatures. There, there, there there's just a lot of. I, I think that really the way Commander is designed as a as a as a card pool, it f- highly favors proactive strategies. Okay, and and to to leverage that, and then as a control deck. So sure, like closing out the game is a problem. I have been just been finding even just keeping pace with those decks and i'm not trying to say i'm not trying to be like a turbo deck i'm just saying like being able to like advance my board and interact in a meaningful manner i have found super behind i don't know about you 100 percent. and like everybody already knows that the biggest issue with control and cdh is just keeping is just the fact that playing interaction is card disadvantage because you have three opponents, you use a counter spell on one spell, and then you're down, your opponents both are up, your other opponent, opponents are both up one card, you know? Right. But like, when we're looking at the format nowadays, there's such a heavier in- focus on just mana production and just mana efficiency because you're seeing all these mana efficient win conditions, and people might not be winning on turn two and three, but they're setting up their really important engines on turn two and three. They're Tim knows, they're Thrastios, the Rhystic Study, and the Mystic Romario, you know, these cards that get them from the early game to the mid game to the late game, I think that really that kind of comes up, and it just comes down to this issue of, it's not just a card disadvantage issue, it's a mana disadvantage issue. Mm-hmm. Agreed. And I just think that even going further, when we were discussing the definition of control, this is really a definition that's been shaped and influenced by 60 card, one versus one formats. Mm-hmm where a one-for-one one is good enough to get you to the end of the game and to win. And sometimes, you know, sometimes you deck out. Sometimes the clock and emit go goes out. You know, it happens. Mm-hmm. But, like, when you look at it, when you look at control in a, six, in a one versus one versus one versus one format, that's when it gets a lot more difficult to actually, like, deal with and, like, do well with because you're not just trying to do a one-for-one, one, you're also trying to do a one for one that also has the side effect of tempoing the table and hopefully influencing the next decision somebody makes, you know, because unlike one versus one, you also need to know when to stop countering stuff. You need to know what to let go. Right. Exactly. So, so like one of the, one of the big things like with me lately is that I've been kind of viewing these and, and, and honestly, a, a, I, I will eventually better define these, but like stacks control mid-range i tend to see that like they're better played like you would play a tempo deck where you're just trying to destabilize your three opponents while you're advancing instead of trying to grind them into dust in the classical sense like you're just trying to keep them off balance enough that they can't really execute a plan effectively and then while you're advancing your state. So like, for yeah. example, like Shorakai, right? It's probably one of the better like control decks currently around and having the card advantage in the command zone is nice. But like also playing things like city of traders to, to make sure that you can play all of your, your two mana rocks that you're playing that you're able to, so that way you can keep, like you can go land talisman into interaction. You know what I'm saying? I'm not saying it's the only viable. I've just used it as an example. The one that kind of popped in my brain. Yeah. Um, Yeah. Like I a hundred percent agree because it's like, I mean, short guy is just, it's an artifact commander. It's an easy to cast commander. And like, we really do need to, admit that any deck that can cast their commander on turn one with a colored source, mm-hmm. a jeweled lotus, go, that's just so powerful because we we already know that the free commander centric spells like Fierce Guardianship and Deflecting Swat yeah. are really good. just dunks, you know, and just having your commander enable more resources mm-hmm. is really amazing. And it's just a common thing we see again and again. Yeah. Well like for example, like basically I personally do not like having any type of 
control or mid range or what like any kind of tempo combo or control combo mm-hmm. um, kind of deck with a commander that cannot be cast off Jewel Dorvis. Yeah. If, if I have to play like 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 it's one of the reasons why I stopped playing Kess. I'm like because I can't play SWAT, I can't play mm-hmm. Fierce, I can't play um 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 deadly relic effectively early enough for mm-hmm. it to matter because i can't power her out quickly yeah I, the best i can because of the three colored pips you know mm-hmm. whereas if it was like a white and a blue or a red and a blue or a blue and a black and then i don't even care if she costs 14 colorless mana it's easier to generate the two color the two different colored pips and whatever amount of colorless mana you can imagine than it is to make blue, black, red, and then yeah. follow that up with anything relevant. You know what I mean? Yeah. And it's just like, I remember when Jewel Lotus was spoiled, everybody's like, what the heck? This is going to be a terrible card. It's going to warp the format. Mm-hmm. And then nothing happened because we are all terrible at speculation. And we are all terrible at card evaluation before we actually play with the card. Hence the uh, tradition of being a magic player. You know, if we all remember Chase French Prodigy from Origin Standard. Um, but it can't go unsaid with how much Jeweled Lotus enabled those free spells. Yeah, totally. Because it, it goes, and it also just bridges the gap for a lot of commanders that were not playable, like, because they were so expensive. And I'm going to use my beloved Azami. She, Jeweled Lotus did not make her at all meta, but it may, it gave the deck quite a boon. And also, like, you see decks like Niv-Mizzet, where their main game plan is just powering out a Dockside or a Jeweled Lotus ASAP, because that's going to get a commander out, and that's going to get their game plan going. Well, and, and, I mean, a lot of what makes Niv playable is the fact that Jeweled Lotus and Dockside got printed. Yep. And then that shortcuts the, the, pimp in te- the pip intensity. Yeah. Um, because lo and behold, backside is a busted card, and and that's kind of another yeah. thing. So like that kind of rounds back into the mana the mana thing is that mm-hmm. playing a control shell that cannot keep up with the mana production of the proactive decks mm-hmm. is a travesty. Because mm-hmm. not to say that you can't do it and that you shouldn't do it you're just admittedly playing CDH on hard mode and yeah. in a tournament, you don't get bonus points for playing on hard mode. Yeah, no, honestly, like this is something that playing control, you're going to be playing, like you're saying CEDH on hard mode. And that's kind of antithetical to the idea behind the format. Yep. But again, we got to be like, okay, well, if you want to play commander, play to the best of its ability. However, we really do need to consider the implications of cards like Dockside and just the color red. Mm -hmm. The color red is the most explosive color in the format, hands down. I will argue this forever and ever, that when you have cards like Dockside, Underworld Breach, oh gosh, what even else? There's Jessica's Will, there's Krark, there's Winota, there's... Just Rhino Flame and Simeon's Spirit Guide. Yeah, like when... When there's an entire color where the idea behind where the identity is being formed is just forming to be one of being as explosive and elevating you from turn one to five off of two mana, right? It obviously speeds up the speed of the format, but it also makes the being a control deck and just fulfilling that role in a good way just that much more difficult. Right. Yeah. Because I mean, when 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 you're when you're going land dork go or you're even if you're going like ancient tomb talisman go against a deck that will go land talisman into some kind of ritual into something else. They're going to get ahead on you because they're converting their cards into mana and then their mana into a board presence faster than you are. Yeah. So therefore you get put into this awkward position where you're like, Oh, well now I got to keep this mana up to interact. Whereas if you went with like, I mean, to be honest, my main argument, like we'll take Rod, Rod Rack, for example. Um, I know everybody's all hype about Rod Rack. My main reason for wanting to play Rod Rack is actually the fact that I have like eight free counter spells in the deck that are all online yeah. from turn one forward. Yeah. 
yeah, it's just like that's what makes it so good. It's just so insane because you know I played Rock Rock Silas, I played in Mox Masters too, and I've been I've been playing it because like I want to because I mean the best way you can become a better Magic player is by playing decks that you aren't familiar with and decks that are really polar opposite because you learn more, you, you understand the play styles, you can kind of incorporate that into other decks you want to play or build, and it's just like God, Rock Rock is such a Excuse my language, but it's such a fucking drug. Like holy hell. Um, I mean, I don't, I don't, uh, I don't find it as as um. How do I put this? I don't find it as exciting as the other as other people do. But what no. I do find is is the fact that like having seven pieces of free interaction online and available to you from your first turn forward is really good compared to like Cass, who is going to have three pieces of free interaction online from turn one. And then we'll gain access to those other three or four pieces from turn three onward. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah, it's really just like, why I'm saying it's such a drug is because I think that, you know, I mean, for myself at least, being able to make turn three plays on turn one is such a, this crazy feeling. And like, this really is rounding back to the just ex the explosiveness of the format and how control finds difficulty dealing with it because I was finding that with Rod Rack Silas specifically, one of the best windows I could find is if I'm sitting there in turn two with five mana and ad nauseum and I have one piece of free interaction, I'm like, mm -hmm. what am I afraid of? Like very little. Just being able to go off before other people set up. Sounds like a super sketchy game plan, but it's incredibly real. Like it's I've what, had so. That's how Goto is still viable. Yeah, Goto makes mana. The entire deck is mana. You count. You count to is it eleven or thirteen? And 11. I don't know. Like you count to eleven and you win the game. Like I mean, there's there's a reason why after when was How Will the Host printed two thousand eighteen? Yeah, yeah, something like there's that. A, there's you know it's been four or five years. There's a reason why making mana is the deck's primary game plan and that hasn't changed because making mana is easy in red mm -hmm. and being explosive is what you want to do yeah. when you want to make a lot of mana at once right so so sorry i mean we, we've we, we've pretty much beaten in the point that like mm -hmm. and as you even pointed out in our our show notes is that you know threats are better than answers yeah which is one of the common themes of this whole series mm -hmm. uh, uh has been that like the ant the threats in commander are way better than the answers. Yeah. It is. And and when you have three players with that mentality against you mm -hmm. as the one player who doesn't, um you're again playing in on hard mode. So I wanted to kind of round back around a little bit and kind of talk about what so in order to kind of make uh, like a tempo combo deck or a aggro, like a, you know, I don't have a good term for it. Honestly, I'm, I'm thinking of, I'm working on one. In fact, if, if you have a new kind of more accurate descriptor of these types of decks, drop it in the comments, you know, I, I'd like to hear it because, and, and a little bit of an explanation would be great, but to, to, to do some things, to maybe refresh those those types of decks that so that way they're not so antiquated. Yeah. Like for example, I've been kind of testing a new Thrasios Tim Nabru. Another Thrasios Tim Nabru. Okay. Um obviously it's running Nas, it's running the the Black Rituals, it's got Elvish Spirit Guide in it. But I'm also running uh three lab man effects and I'm running three um consult effects. So I'm running okay. Finding Witch, Tana Pack, Demonic Consult. I'm running Jace Builder Mysteries, Lab Maniac, and Oracle. Okay. And, and counting um if you want to count Praetor's Grasp as well. Obviously. Yeah. And the reason why is that one of the biggest problems I always ran into with playing like any kind of CST variant, whatever you want to call it, was that I always needed two tutors to win. And off of those two tutors, and I had to like get the two tutors. So like I, I needed two tutors in my hand, the mana to play them. Then I needed to untap and win or 
like some kind of amalgamation. It was kind of unrealistic, honestly, with with all of the wheels and everything going on. Oh, that's another thing. Wheels make it really hard to sculpt when you're yeah. in a control shell. Oh my god, I hate wheels so much. Yeah, yeah, they make it kind of difficult. But yeah. the idea is with the deck is that since I have that full, like since I have a very high density of consult effects and I have a very high density of lab maniac effects, that my 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 my, my threat density is very high. So I don't mm-hmm. need to be actively searching for those two. Like I don't need two tutors to win all the time because I've got three copies of each card. So I'm more likely to naturally draw into them, even if they're not the best version of that effect. You know what I'm saying? Furthermore, if I cast a ad nauseum, I'm on a very heavy rock build. I think I have like 17 rocks in the deck. I'm only running like three dorks. And I'm also running calling ritual. Uh, to to help give me large, massive amounts of mana. That's just busted, though. Yeah, <laughs> and and I'm f- and in addition to that, I'm also on Gemstone Caverns. Okay. I'm on City of Traders, and I'm on Ancient Tomb, and that's okay. because being in Sans Red, I'm playing a lot of two mana rocks, and I need to have a good density of ways to be able to cast them. So mm-hmm. not only do I want to be able to cast them off a of soul ring, off a of mana crypt, I want to be able to go one land drop, two mana rock, and then do something. Yeah. I'm also very highly teched with like, I'm, I'm running like Mox Amber. I'm running all the zero drops that you, rocks you can. And then I'm running a full suite a, a relatively full suite of zero cost interaction. I'm not playing any interaction that costs, more than one mana outside of yep. like Psych Rift and uh, Brump Decay or mm-hmm. Astrophy. Yeah. And then, and then on top of that, I'm not playing Seaborn Muse. I'm playing Wandering Archaic as my, my, my top end, um, e- and, and, you know, Eldritch Evolution target for th- Timna because the ceiling is much higher. In the fact that anytime somebody plays a spell, I get a copy. And it's a lot easier to get value off of that card instead of paying, you know, instead of doing the setup for the for the Seaborn Muse and then trying to get to that untap and then using all of those cards I'm generating off of that Seaborn Muse to protect the Seaborn Muse, which is what always fucking happens. So whereas yeah. like with the Wondering Archaic, it's every time anybody... Like, even if the first thing somebody does is put a sword to plowshares to it, I at least get a trigger for a copy off of it automatically before anything else happens. So, so, so I've kind of reshaped the way that I've built CST to kind of, I, I am going to be playing from behind no matter what I do, because I'm not a dockside deck, yeah. but I'm able to keep pace what like I'm able to interact and advance my game plan. So like with that in mind, like doing some types of, of refreshes and how we we think about these types of decks, especially given how chaotic uh, multiplayer can be, especially given the propensity for people to play turbo Nas decks. Now all, all it takes is one turbo Nas player in a pod to to wheel a couple of times and yeah, you know, like well, 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 my 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 fourteen rustic study triggers don't mean anything because yep. they've just reset my hand twice. Yeah, and I think that when we want to try and retool control for the current meta, I think there are a couple of things that need to be done, and these are things I had to do myself, and these are things I'm finding are working way too well. And it's not even in just turbo metas because like, and I want to say right now for everybody listening, my experience is specifically with mono blue as on of scrolls. It is a five CMC commander, very slow, slow step at the table all the time, you know? Right. Um, so the first thing is that we need to understand that mana is kink. It is being able to develop your board state while also being able to hold up interaction is incredibly difficult. And it's just something where a lot of time we might need to decide what to do 
with or against. We need to decide to do one thing or another, mm-hmm. which leads us into this train of thought of if mana is king, then doesn't that mean that mana efficient answers are king? And then we also need to... I, However, I understand you can disagree with this, but when I mean mana efficient answers, I'm talking about like just the classic one CMC counterspell suite. Yeah, I agree with that. I just mean that like even then, I don't necessarily find mana efficient answers to be king when I have... I mean, even if I'm playing against like mid-range decks and stack stacks mm-hmm. and, and just... Like, that's the problem. <laughs> it's like, I, yeah. I, I can tech one way, and then I mm-hmm. don't play against that. And that's another mm-hmm. kind of pitfall with control, is that you need a meta to play into, to play to have a control deck. You do. But I mean, like, when we really look at the one CMC answers, like, the things that they are fighting against are really things that we'll find common against all different kinds of decks. Like, for one CMC answers, you have, like, Swan Song, mm-hmm. that hits Rule Laws, it's Ad Nauseam, it hits Breach. Um, you have Dispel, which hits Red Blast, General Veil of Summer's Protection, um, stuff like that. Yep. Um, again, hits Ad Nauseum. And offer you can't, yeah, hits a lot of tutors, and offer you can't refuse hits gosh knows what else. You know, hits everything. It gives them mana, so it's a little, I would personally rank it a little bit lower. But, um, you also have all the general, quote-unquote, free interaction. Force of Will, Force of Negation, um, I Mental Mist. Yeah, Mind Break Trap, which has been an awesome yeah. yeah, all that stuff. And, you know, like, we really need to look at these things and be like, these are the spells that I need to prioritize. Mm-hmm. Because these are the spells that will save me from these explosive starts. Right. And will allow me to develop my, continue to develop my game plan into the mid and early game. Mm-hmm. And that increases your chance of winning. Right. Yeah. And so... Because that is the thing with, with, with the Thrasios Timna build is like, I'm on SWAT, I'm on Deadly Relic, I'm on Force of mm-hmm. Will, Force of Negation. I've even thought about Force of Vigor, Mind Break yeah. Trap, Pact of Negation. Pretty much, like like you said, everything's like one mana, except for like one mm-hmm. or two spells. You know what I'm saying? We'll find either way. And this is a train of thought that I have. I've posted a little bit about it. I've discussed about it a little bit. And... You, you are more than free to disagree with me on this. And this is a take that over the last month or so, I have found myself wanting to tell myself it's not true, but it is. If you're not playing red, or if you're control deck, and you want the game to go long, and you are playing blue, I personally believe you should be playing the blue blasts. I, 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 I could see them being... I, 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 I mean, I list them on the on the budget mm-hmm. ruse spell template as like potential interaction cards. Like mm-hmm. I don't think they're beyond yeah. the realm of playable. Yeah. And so I want to just kind of my reasoning for this is because red is the most explosive color in the format. Yeah. We as a control deck want to try and have as many good tempo plays as possible. By being able to stifle these explosive turns that mm-hmm. form red cards, like Dockside Extortionist, yep. like we, out-temp- we out-tempo the opponent, we halt them from going for on turn- to turn 7 on turn 1 or 2, and it can- allows us to continue going through the late game. Right. And this isn't even to mention that... This isn't even to mention the other things that the Blue Blast hit. Um, obviously, the Red Blast, easy. that's the first thing you probably think about. It also hits bombs. It hits... Uh, Final Fortune effects. It hits Clark. It hits Winota. It hits Jessica's Will. It hits Deflecting Swat. It hits Underworld Breach. All kinds hits, of stuff. Rituals. Yeah. It hits, I mean, it hits Nagila. It hits. Um. Oh gosh. What even else? Like it just. I'm. It's just like I'm sitting there and I'm thinking like. I was, just thinking these cards are so unplayable. But then it's like you sit there and you go, how prevalent? How prevalent is red in the meta? Well, I call it a dockside meta. So. Yeah. Like. Like when it's a dock side when it's a dock side meta, you see red in almost every pod except for like I don't know, really interesting pods, I guess. Like I think that there are still redless pods, but I mean there are redless pods, but I I yeah. I think you're hard pressed to find them. I, I'm I, I don't remember seeing them. Let's put it that way. At least yeah, not if, when I'm playing budgetless. Like maybe sure when I'm playing like my hundred uh, playing in the hundred dollar budget league or whatever, maybe, but even yeah. then I'm probably playing red. But so so but again that kind of ties back into how like I'm discussing like playing these decks like a tempo deck, like what you would mm-hmm. consider a tempo deck in one v one. Because 
red blasting or ritual doesn't seem that great or a rite of flame doesn't seem that great. But when you when you realize that like one, the player playing the rite of flame is not in a position to fight over that. Mm-hmm. You have now stifled their development. So that way they are closer to on par with you. The problem yeah. arises. And again, this kind of ties into the next issue with control is that you have three opponents and when yeah. you go down a card and your opponent goes down a card, you have two players that don't. So now they're actually the ones mm-hmm. up a card and you've answered a threat for them. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I think that at that point, just because it's like, it's a really weird situation because on one hand you stifle one opponent on the other hand, it's really weird to say this, but you're not, you're not the only one in the shitty situation. No. I mean, I think that I, like you were saying, like blue blasting a right of flame. Who the, who's gonna fight over that? Unless it's going into a dock side. Like, even then, like they just like even then, I would just let it go. Like it's not worth it to yeah. deal with that. I think that would kind of incentivize your opponent to be like, oh well, now I need to like maybe instead of me trying to go for one, I need to like sit there and go, what can I do? Right, right. Well, and maybe a lot of their turn was predicated upon that. But, like, that's the thing. So now that you have kind of slowed down, now you have two players, you and you as the control deck, and then this other player who you have hindered their development um, are now in, in a slower spot. Now, hopefully, they're a responsible player, and they're able to kind of read the tea leaves and, like, okay, well, now I need to make sure I don't die to my next untap. Yeah. Instead of just, like, oh, let the blue deck handle it. Ha ha, sucker. You know what I mean? So, like, that is kind of the thing, though, is that when you're a control deck in the pod, other players are very incentivized to have you answer the problems for them. And they will lean on you and lean on you and lean on you. And you you have to be a smooth talker to to really, really get them to pitch in and not just greed lord on you while you're being the responsible one. Uh, so, so another thing that I think that kind of is a key, key thing to help with these te- kind of tempo plays and these kind of tempo swings Uh, especially against like when you're trying to play a more control archetype or a more like tempo combo archetype is having, having the right tools. So I wanted to maybe talk about a couple of cards that I think are good to have around. Some of them are pretty obvious and some of them maybe not quite as obvious for just different tempo like they're pretty efficient for what they do and they they serve very niche like not niche but like very specific types of roles so dress down i mean you're you're a big fan of that one uh negates mm-hmm. it has flash it costs two mana it replaces itself yep. when it comes into play those are all mm-hmm. great things and then it negates all creatures abilities for a single turn mm-hmm so that's really yeah. good at like answering Oracle, answering Dockside, that kind of stuff. Yeah. It also just it also just blinks a Timna for a turn and a Gila, a Winota, you know, like it it's really awkward because like it stops your it makes it so the creatures you have maybe aren't as good, but also like if you're control deck, you probably care less about those. Right. But then again at the same time it's like you just have to ask yourself what do you value more? The blinking all this stuff for a turn because right. The, the biggest issue with effects like this sometimes is that they don't get rid of themselves. Like, you can't... Sometimes you can't play through them. Sometimes you're just facing down a humility, and you're like, oh, I can't have this in place, stifling my own plan. But Grestown sacrifices itself. Like, it's it's a, crack, it's a cracked magic card, honestly. It is pretty cracked. <laughs> you got that right. So, like, the next one I wanted to go over a little bit was... And this one I, I think is pretty good. Like I think it's and it I I, th- I think mm-hmm. it's there's grounds for it to see a little more play. Is out of time. Yeah. Out of time reads because I don't have the ability to put cards up on the screen because I'm still on a 12 year old computer and I don't have Adobe. <laughs> I'm I'm doing I'm trying I'm working 20 hours of overtime a a, a week to try to save up. Like I'm getting. It's there. All, you're doing great though. I'm getting there. We're almost we're in the home stretch, boys. Uh, Heck yeah. Out of time is is an enchantment. So this doesn't have flash, unfortunately. It's white, white a one. Uh when it comes in a, when it enter, when it enters the battlefield, you untap all creatures, then phase them out. Mm-hmm. And then at, until out of time leaves the battlefield, and then you put a timeout counter 
You basically put a fading counter on out of time for each creature that was phased out. So on a even on a nominal board, let's say you just phase out three creatures. That's three turns that those creatures are not accessible. And if you're doing this on some like if you're doing this against like a dock side that kind of got stopped or somebody's Krom or somebody's Timnook or an Agila or even a Winota, those are all gone for three turns. And it's really hard since they're not when they get phased out, I don't think they change zones. So you just it's, they're just gone. Yeah, they just act like they don't exist. It's kind of like why um for a long time people like do play Oubliette and Zer the Enchanter because you can just get rid of commanders and they can't be cast again because they're just non existing. And it's like I think that out of time is this even though there's a huge premium on instant speed removal. There is. There- I think that out of time is such is such an interesting card because it doesn't get rid of them, so you can't like reanimate, you can't recast. Mm-hmm. But it also keeps them gone long enough that oftentimes you just win before everything comes back, you know? Well it I mean, even if you're just killing off a Krom and a Najila or like a Winota mm-hmm. and like one or two Winota enablers, mm-hmm. three turns is a long time and in, yeah. in a format that's averaging six turns. You know yeah, I mean? and oh yeah, and like I think a perfect example of out of time and how powerful it truly is is I want to talk about the semifinals match of uh, Punt City. Sure. Um, or some game in Punt City won. So it ended up it was a pot that had four people, but the two relevant people here are a comedian MTG um, and Charles, um, the monolite guy. Mm-hmm. And basically, what ended up happening is that. Ian swung in with Winota for lethal, and off one of his Winota flips, he got a Thalia, um, the one that has first, the new three drop one that has a first strike, the mm-hmm. one that's Eldritch Moon. And Charles had an Academy Rector. So, what we need to understand, yeah, no, so what we need to understand is that first strike damage happens first for yep. people that may not know. And so, Charles blocks the Thalia with the Academy Rector. It dies. The track trigger, the sack trigger goes on the stack. He exiles it and grabs out of time. Now, none of the other creatures on the board have first strike. So what this means is that combat damage has not been dealt yet. So Charles is still alive, mm-hmm. and so out of time enters. And before all that damage goes through, out of time exiles all of Ian's creatures. Phases them out. Doesn't exile. Oh, yeah, phases all of them out, and he has like a ten turn clock until they all come back. Mm-hmm. And if I remember right, Charles won this one. I think so. Like, like there's just, there's, it's just like, yeah, there were some misplays that happened here, but like, just the fact that out of time was able to do such a spot on job, mm-hmm. like, even if he just drew it for turn, I think the result would have been the same. What? Well, right. Well, and that's the thing. Like, so even if they remove it after a turn, they face back in. You don't get more ETB triggers off of those creatures. No, they don't enter. And it and it does it does like. Blackout, reanimator strategies, commander centric strategies, mm-hmm. all the big mana engines, you know, yeah. locks people off of like doing shenanigans with all of their like with like dockside loops, like things like that. The other thing that's nice is that it's three mana, so for a sweeper, it's pretty pretty inexpensive. Like yeah. it's it's sure it's, and, and it and, and it has some notable upside over like something like Toxic Deluge. Because Toxic Deluge puts them all in the yard, and there's a lot of ways to reanimate creatures off the yard. Or at bare minimum, if you just wipe somebody's board and they're playing a Breach deck, like, okay, now they got one or two more Breach activations off of you. Because you've just put two, you know, three or four cards in their graveyard, right? Yeah, it's like, I want to be honest with you, if you Toxic Deluge my board in any deck that has creatures on playing Underworld Breach, I'm like, okay, cool, so now my Underworld Breach turns just a lot easier, you know? Yeah, 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 you just kind of helped it out. Um, so the next one I wanted to kind of discuss, uh, was Ranger Captain of EOS. So those of you at home that don't know what Ranger Captain of EOS does is it is a human soldier three, three for white, white, and one has a activated, a a triggered ability of when it enters a battlefield, search your library for a creature with one CMC or less, one man of value or less for the Churins at home. And then you put it in your hand. Um, a couple of the big notable ones to get with that 
are Esper Sentinel, which is another card advantage engine. Ragavan. Um, those are probably, that's, you know, you can get dorks. <laughs> you could get Deathrite Shaman, stuff like that. Uh, but oh. probably Esper Sentinel's the main one you're going to get. Yeah. And then lastly, it has an activated ability of Sacrifice, Ranger Captain of Eos. Uh, your opponents cannot cast non-creature spells till end of turn. So there's yes. a silence built onto it. Yes. This, this card is crack. bonkers good. Yeah, I... Like, it's just so insane because, like, I just remember that, like, when I was first playing Tina Jessica, I sat there, I had a Ranger Captain, and I was sitting there, and I was like, nobody can win. And if it gets to my turn and nobody tries to win, I win. And it's like, but then on the flip side, it's like, I can't win. I don't know how to beat it. I can't beat it, you know, and it like, but it's like for reference, like Ranger Captain is such an insane magic card that like, it's part of the reason why a lot of people, if you're at all familiar with the CDH meta, a lot of the turbo decks are starting to play more extra turn spells. Yeah. And it's kind of negated it's, a little bit. Yeah. It's specifically to be silence effects like this mm-hmm. that can't be interacted with because you sit there, you cast your extra turn spell, you go for the win, it goes to your next turn, you just run it back. Right. And it's just like traditional builds can't do that. Yeah. But well, and, and, and that's exactly it. Like so so not only does it fetch you up a card advantage engine. Yeah. In the form of Esper Sentinel, now you have a silence, and then in the interim mm-hmm. you have a three three that can attack on either keep yeah. Timna draws start chipping away at people's life totals, like all kinds of stuff. Mm, yeah, it's just, I honestly think that, I know that a lot of people discuss over what is the best white card in the format. A lot of people say Esther Sentinel because it draws you cards, but like, drawing cards doesn't ma- Drawing cards doesn't matter if you can't win the game off of it. Drawing cards doesn't matter if it can't keep you from losing the game. Like, yeah, turn one Esper Sentinel is great, and you just ride that and sure you can try and win because it helps you build your hand up. But Ranger Captain is a card that once it hits the battlefield, because let's be honest here, Ranger Captain's really difficult to interact with because it's a creature. Right. And it's white, so you can't blast it. Yeah. Like, I mean, you can remove it, but now you're wasting a removal spell, and then they just silence and response kind of thing. And. Yeah, blah, 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 blah. Plus, I mean, everybody, once there's a ranger on board, everybody kind of tries to level, mm-hmm. kind of angle each other into get, making it get popped on yeah. for somebody else. Like, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, can I slide like, this under? Can I slide this? You, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, it's kind of like the, it's kind of like this classic game of seeing who can, who can leave their hand on the stove for the longest without right. screaming, you know? Yeah. Like, it's... Yeah. It's like, and that's such a, such a terrible analogy, but like, it's so incredibly true. Like, I mean, I get you, yeah, I get the the analogy on it. Yeah, and it's so, so like with so I mean, so, but again, like these are more of the like these pieces are very effective in the current meta, and and Ranger getting a card advantage engine is really nice. So I'm gonna actually lump the next two together. And we can kind of go over them a little bit. Uh, Rhystic Study and Mystic Remora. Yeah. So Rhystic Study, for those at home. Hi, Libby. You can see in the corner. Hey, puppy dog. Um, is one blue, two colorless. Is an enchantment uh, that whenever a player, whenever an opponent casts a spell, uh, you may draw a card if they do not pay one mana. And it will trigger each time anybody, any opponent casts a spell. Mystic Remora is one blue enchantment, has a cumulative upkeep of one. And then whenever an opponent casts a non-creature spell, you may draw a card if they do not pay four mana. So much like with Esper Sentinel, the the ceiling on this on these cards is much higher than typical mana advantage or card advantage engines. Because one of the things that we've I've kind of figured out. And shout out to Mikey and Drake on the on the uh, Miscast podcast. Uh, kind of initially, kind of approached me with this idea of the passive card draw that has like a higher ceiling, and how that that higher ceiling gives you like you pay it once the investment for that card draw, 
and then it will scale as you go along the game. Like Rhystic Study, the more opponents you have, the more spells that are cast, potentially the more cards you draw. Um, whereas like a Dark Confidant just draws you one card on your turn, whereas a Remora can draw you as many spells there as are cast. Or like, we yeah. say Esper Sentinel. Esper Sentinel could potentially draw you up to 12 cards a turn cycle. That's so nuts. Cards. I'm not saying it will. I mean, it's most yeah. likely only going to draw you one or two per wheel of the table, but that's still a better rate than like something like a Bob or a Sylvan Library. Yeah. Because and paying for life for it. Mm hmm. Yeah, and like it also kind of loops not just not just the fact that it's passive card advantage, just the fact like I think the most important thing that you mentioned is that you pay the cost once and you don't pay anything else. I think that it yeah, it draws you cards, but like I think that another really big thing is that this is something that you put the initial mana cost into and it gives you more resources and then after that your hands are kind of free to do what you need to. Your hands aren't tied into having to keep on playing it. You know, like, Mr. Remora is kind of a bit more awkward because you have to keep paying the upkeep, but Remora in a, Remora in a format where 99% where creatures are considered uncounterable because nobody plays counters for them, mm -hmm. besides, like, forcible impact negation, like, you're going to be drawing a handful of cards off of it. Right. Well, and, and and they scale. So, like, the more aggressive yeah. your, your opponents are, the more mm -hmm. triggers you will get with those cards. Versus yeah. something like a Sylvan Library where you're locked in at three, and you have to pay that steady rate for it. Or Timna, where you have to attack. Or Thrasios, okay. where you have to pay the four. Yep. And on and on and on and on and on. So one yeah, of the just... big shifts I have found to make these style of decks more effective is that yep. I can deploy these engines and then for... set it and forget it. Like the old uh, infomercial, the old Rom yeah. Peel rotisserie. I get it. Yeah, like, it's just... It's just really one of these things where... I feel like people totally ignore it, but like you were saying, like you just cast it, you forget about it, and you get you get results from it. Like it's just so insane because I think it's one of the most overlooked parts of the card is that mm -hmm. it just allows you to keep on building your board state and keep on progressing towards your mm -hmm. game plan while also helping you towards that and also protecting your game plan because it yeah. draws you into direction. Right. Yeah, exactly. Well and and then and then finally, so the, the 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 last one that I listed on the list is a little bit of a curveball. So I know we've been poo-pooing on um, two-mana interaction the whole talk, but I do think that there is some two-mana interaction worth discussing. And I think the, the marquee for two-mana counter magic is delay. Uh, delay is one blue, one colorless counter target spell. And then the countered spell goes to exile and then gains three time counters on it, which is you remove a time counter. The controller of the spell uh, removes a time counter at the beginning of their upkeep. And then if there are no more, when the last time counter is removed, there is a trigger that goes on the stack and they may cast that spell without paying its mana cost. So yep. oftentimes the big payoff spell in CDH is like turn three, turn four. Okay. Yeah. So if you're able to cast the delay in that window, then you're looking at turn six to turn seven for them to have that spell available again to cast, which I think is very much a, um, I'm trying to think of how to put this. So that is a, that is a long time, but if you counter an Adnaz on turn three and they don't get it back till turn six, the math shows that you are like the game's going to be done. Not to mention oh. you have every player no sees it coming. So if they're not winning, they're going to shields up for it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. It's also just like, I, I personally love delay. I think that delay is one of those cards that I understand why it's not played. However, do I think that I should see more play? Yes, because you know, we, we've cut the classic counter spell from so many decks. We Decks are cutting Mana Drain. I like, like this better than Mana Drain because it's just so much easier to... Blue Blue yeah. is hard in this economy, boss. Yeah, no, and like, I was just about to say that, like, a blue mana and one generic mana 
that's easy to cast. And that's easy to hold up. Oh, because oh, it's a lot easier to, to, to have mm -hmm. on hand when you need it than it is. Yeah. You know, not. It's, and it counters yeah. anything. Yeah, like it's in, it's, it has, it counters anything. It's easy to cast. It's specifically for three color and higher decks because the pip intensity is super important when you're trying to consistently fix mana every turn. Mm -hmm. Like, it's just one of those cards where, like, the downside isn't so much of a downside when you realize that the game's probably going to be open three turns. Well, and you now have exiled whatever spell you countered, and now they don't have access to it. So Yeah, like, and, like... Oh, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, like, if you exile their Dockside or their Ad Nauseum or mm -hmm. their Eldritch Evolution or whatever it is, whatever they're, whatever they're casting as to pay off, it yeah. now just sits in exile. Like if oh. somebody casts an oracle and you counter it, they don't have access to it for three turns. And now yeah. they have to pivot around that. Yeah, you know, and I'm you know, unfortunately that Thorpe will then have haste when it comes in when it gets cast off of a suspend. You it know, does. that's you're right. I did leave that out. <laughs> you got me. Yeah. But no, it's it's just such a flexible card. It's it's just I love it. It's it might be a pet card, but I feel like it just does the job so well. I just think if you're looking at two mana counter magic, I think that's probably the first one you should look at. Just because yeah. it's so simple to cast and it very cleanly answers a lot of things, much like how out of time answers things in a way that can't be abused later on. Very mm. well. You know what I mean? All the things yeah. that are phased out without a time, when you remove the out of time, they just phase back in. You don't get new ETP triggers. They don't go mm -hmm. to the graveyard, so you can't reanimate them. Blah, 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 blah. They're not in exile, so you can't recast them from the command zone. Mm -hmm. Like, all kinds of stuff. Yeah. And Delay kind of has a similar kind of ask. Like, I mm -hmm. would play this over Mana Drain, personally. Just because yeah. it's so much easier to cast. And very rarely do I ever want that colorless mana that I get off of Mana Drain, mm -hmm. ever. Like Your Thrasius activations. And no, even then I don't like, no, I know I'm... the amount of times I've cast mana drain and then just let that mana empty from my pool has yeah. grossly outweighed the amount of times that I've been able mm -hmm. to put it into something useful. I mean, yeah. like I... almost to the point where like, I'd rather just run counter spell. Not really. It was a joke, but I mean, almost that often. Yeah. And I think that, and I think again, we're t we're discussing relics of the past here. We're discussing way new ways of thinking that we really need to embrace and go forward yeah. with. And I think that it's really something where we look at the format how it was two years ago. The format has changed a lot, a lot in two years. Like two and a half years ago, the Oracle. No, it was like almost three years ago. Breach the Oracle became right. staples. Yeah. You know, like. Two years ago, the format was still developing because we were still experiencing growing pains from those cards being printed. Like, mm -hmm. we have a lot of sentiments in the format nowadays that have not that we haven't gotten rid of yet. Like, yeah, like a, it's like the blue blasts; those are now just becoming a thing. Oh, and 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 even if they're not as effective as they're hyped, the fact that they mm. do have a reason, like they are reasonably useful, at, yeah. at even just at like a nominal glance. Mm -hmm. it, it is telling of kind of the times that we're that we're in and yeah it's, it's not to say that the forex thrasios mirrors don't exist out there in the wild mm -hmm. i just don't see them and i mean to be honest like the ch pods i see are all over the place yeah you know where i play but those six cards we've talked about like i absolutely would not ever mm -hmm. not be sad to play them if i was in a in a in a more controlless shell, and in, in a in a in a in a, like those are all great tempo plays to play on people. Every single one of those cards we've just discussed: the dress down, the delay, out of time, Rhystic study, Mystic Remora, and Ranger Captain. You know, yeah, and it's it's just like really all the points that I feel like we're hammering home is that one. If we want to continue seeing control as an archetype in the format, something needs to change. I think that in the direction the format is going, the format 
it's getting stupid fast. Like, I think I see more turn two and three wins than I have in the last two years. I think that those aren't just like, oh, you have a turn two at nauseum. Now it's like, I have a turn two Underworld Reach with three pieces of protection, you know? But, like, well, also it's... Go ahead. I don't know, it's okay. It's like, that's a natural byproduct of the format getting older because people continue to tune the decks that they love and the really, like, the really fast decks continue to get faster. Well, and that's the thing is like where all that where all that research is going. Where's all the where's all the tech being funneled in? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And and, and the other issue that arises is like there's been like I don't know like a hundred something new legendary creatures. I get I get questions every day about like some rando commander that I've never heard of, and they're like, I want to build a budget deck, and I'm like, I don't even know how to build it without a budget. And and. And I look at it and I'm just like, dog, no, like this, this ain't going to do it. Yeah. I'm just seeing the pain on your face right now from having to discuss this. Cause I can tell that there's some trauma from like the flat. It's the flat Vietnam flashbacks kind of thing, you know? Yeah. Like, but like right. and you could literally just go to Scryfall and pick a random area, rev, random legend in the last 12 months has been printed. And somebody has asked me to like brew a budget version of it. I'm just like, this is a this is a zero one with no abilities that costs nine mana and doesn't have blue in it or black it exist. and and I don't know what you want, man. Like, like so, there's actually a card like that. It's called Scornful Egotist, except it has like a four mana morph cost. It's literally, I think it's like a seven or eight mana one one. Yeah, I'm not even joking with you. Like, right? But like, uh, I'll be I'm, honest. I'm probably got a DM somewhere from somebody wanting to like yeah. a CH oh. version of that. Just like, I oh, yeah, I can't even do And that. like, no, I totally get it. And like, I'm gonna be honest with you, I look at spoilers and I forget about them. I think I pay attention to like five spoilers from every set because I'm like, how is this relevant? Because you know, I really only play Commander, I, I'm i just too deep in it, you know. Like, I play, I dabble in Canlander, I try to keep up with like Legacy and like Modern sometimes, but like, it's just, and you know, we're kind of going more into not really format issues, but more of um corporate issues you know is that everybody knows about product fatigue like we're seeing so many new cards every single year like yeah we literally went like they literally pushed back the phyrexia one spoilers because people are like there's too much happening right i mean like uh, like brothers wars been out like two weeks and they're already doing like the next set i'm just like dog like, oh what? dude i know like pete like like prices haven't even settled yet, and they're like, "Are you ready for Phyrexia Auto will be one?" No, no I'm not. Stop. No, no, I, I want to spend, and like this is as somebody who is like, as somebody who really loves to just collect, like because I feel like anymore I find a lot of joy from collecting more than from playing. Because I love playing the game, but also like mm-hmm. just being able to find these really amazing cards and like being able to look screw look through Scryfall and being like, "Oh, well, I haven't seen this card," and like being able to put into my collection because it has some niche use yeah. like yeah. i i can't do that as efficiently because i sit there i go oh my god i don't yeah like i didn't even realize i didn't have a japanese foil offer you can't refuse until a week and a half ago this has been out for almost a year uh, yeah like like for example somebody wanted me to help them brew the urza might stone weak stone meld oh, yeah. thing yeah and, and i'm just looking at it and i'm like the best thing I see going on this dude is the cost reduction. Yeah. But I can think of like other commanders that don't cost five or four, how much ever that damn thing costs. It's like an 11 mana investment. Yeah. I'm just like, uh, so a little PSA for you. If you want help from me, pick a deck that is established and I will help you make it more approachable. But I'm I'm not here to brew mid power decks. I'm just not, and I'm just gonna tell you straight up. If it's some yeah. new zany wild idea that you wanna make ceh viable, you're not. Not everybody can be the smartest guy in the room, and and I, I've noticed that a lot with people who want to play stacks a lot, that want to play control a lot. Everybody wants to reinvent the wheel every five minutes, and there's only so many magic cards printed. And I can guarantee you, there's people better than me working on this stuff, way smarter than I am. Yeah. And and if you just wait five minutes, it'll they'll do all the work for you. 
You don't have to do it. Sure, exactly. you can refine it and make it your own, but but y- y- you don't have to. It's already there. And I know that that's maybe not something that everybody wants to hear, but to be frank, like most of us aren't that good at brewers. We think we are, but we're not. And I'm not. I'm not that great. Pretty much I mean, all my budget decks are just cheaper versions of established decks. Yeah, I mean, I just suck at magic in general. Like, I'm on, I'm on here, I'm on here because I was like, Timmy, I want to talk about control. He's like, okay, let's do this. Let's do it. And we are. Right. I mean, I know we've kind of meandered off a little bit, but it kind of ties mm. in because a lot of the mentality of people who want to play control, a lot of the mentality of people who want to play stacks, is they want to make people play honest magic the way Richard Garfield intended. Yeah. And, and while that mean. It, it, making four players makes making three opponents play honest magic when you're the only one invested in playing honest magic is a fool's errand at best. I'm just gonna that's the conundrum is how do you make three opponents play by your rules when nobody wants to listen to you? Yeah, you know, yeah, I what? think that guess what the answer to that is you don't, <laughs> yeah, I think that like because we're kind of. Going back, we're discussing people wanting to be way smarter than they might actually be. You know, and I'm going to tell you right now, I'm not going to be calling anybody out on this. I'm just going to say this because I see this all the time when I play against Stax people. Not everybody can be Charles. No. Like, yeah, Charles and I, there's is one great. Charles, and that's Charles. Yeah, there's one Charles. I'm like, I love Charles. We don't, we don't need more than one 40 tweet, 40 page long tweet, you know? Like, we don't. Like, I love Charles, but, like, nobody else will be Charles, and that's fine. But, like... And that's not to say that there's not other good stacks players, but the amount of good stacks yeah. players versus the amount of bad stacks players. Yeah, and, like... Oh, so that's the other thing. So when you're trying to learn stacks, and when you're trying to learn control, your yeah. games go longer. So it takes you more reps. Mm-hmm. It takes you more time to learn how to play these things effectively. Because... I'm just going to throw a fake number out. Let's say your games go to 60 minutes. Your opponent, your games as the control player tend to go to 60 minutes out of 90. And your turbo opponents, or you're just your faster, your, your, your non-interactive combo decks. We'll just call them that, right? Doesn't matter. You could be Godo, could be Silvala, could be Ad Nauseum. And not to say those decks don't interact because they do, but let's just, they end their games in 45 right? So every four games that they play is three games you play. The fact that as a control deck, and I know I do this all the time, I guarantee Timmy does this all the time, I know that you listen to do this all the time with any deck that you're starting to build, you goldfish the hell out of it. Mm-hmm. I do. And that doesn't work with, with control nope. or any type of like temp, like any deck that requires on your interacting with opponents very heavily yep. to, to do its thing. Yeah, like for myself, because, you know, I, I also have Tina Jessica built, and that is a, a really fast uh, red-white-black deck that aims to win the game with mm-hmm. Bomberman, uh, Oryx, Salvagers, and Lion's Eye Diamond, or Dual Caster and Twin Flame Mage through an Adonizing or an Underworld Breach line. Mm-hmm. And I can sit there for days and days and days and just goldfish the deck, and I can have an incredibly much more polished version than any deck that I begin on that I want to be controlled deck in the same time period. Yep. And that's just because... You're not going to get the same results. You're not going to yeah. be able to get as many games in. But, like, this is just a thing where I think that there are so many obstacles for control specifically, and we really need to reevaluate it just as a whole. And I can't give you a correct answer on what needs to be done. No, I, I mean, we've got a few ideas. Like, we've discussed, like, mm-hmm. retooling the tech. Yeah. Making making sure that our, 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 our mana base and our ramp package and our, our mana yep. acceleration package is super aggressive to yep. to to keep pace not not we're not trying to be yep. a turbo deck but we're trying to just keep up with them and yeah and when i say keep up i mean that term very like you got to squint your eye and turn your head like it's just yeah. so we're not like going land dork and then they're mm-hmm. like i had no zone to and we're like fuck i only got to play a dork you know what i mean yeah and like i think that when we discuss people wanted to be the smartest person in the room i think that this also this causes so many issues and really if you want to play control and you want to try and make the archetype better 
the best thing you can do is just go back to the basics, start clean, fresh, you know, because, and I'm going to use this term with love and that I say that we don't need to be frog brained because what I mean by this is a lot of time with the Get Rock Monster deck, you see it has an 80 step combo and they're trying, and they keep on finding new combos within the deck that work and win the game, but the deck is becoming needlessly complicated. And you see all these people trying to make these 30 step combo and game plans. Hey. All I'm saying is you could eliminate 15 pa 50 pages of the Frog server if you just played Ebony Charm. Yeah, and like, I mean, games are, decks are becoming needlessly complicated, and people are using language that's needlessly complicated, because I'll be honest with you, I'm not the brightest of people. I just know how to play cards sometimes. I know how to play rights half the time. Yeah. But just slowing down, starting from the beginning, seeing what needs to be done, and going from there is the best thing you can do. Like, yeah, for myself. Like, like to be honest, I don't think it's more optimal to have a 80, 800, no. 80 page primer just so you can save one card slot. Yeah. I think it's more optimal to play a card slot that not only is it a win con, but has at least some a very useful text outside of that win con. Like if we're going to use Ebony Charm as an example, like. Exiling three cards from somebody's graveyard is not useless. And the win context on that is you gain a life, they lose a life. Yeah, and it's just... I really think that as the format continues to get more and more you know, advanced, people are losing sight of the basics. People are sitting there going... Are forgetting that mana is the most important part of the game. It's a crucial... It's the building blocks of the entire game. I, I think it's like kind of feeding into the hype is what it yeah. is a lot of it. it because there's so many like commander players like to brew and I, I get it you like to brew you like to brew you like to brew i'm just not your guy despite the fucking channel name I, <laughs> you know, it was a mistake i get it um but like everybody wants to kind of brew 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 brew, brew. and i'm like if you brew in all of this when do you actually have time to play you know and so that was the thing is I started this like hundred dollar league on a on a on a play Discord and I advertised it. I hosted a game day game one. You know what we got for prizes for this thing? We got a force of will, a null rod, a chalice of the void, a wooded foothills. We've got a foil birds of paradise, a foil uh, dragon skull summit, a, a a fancy art um, extended art art kind of Amiria. Uh, there's some other prizes too. That I just can't. I'm drawing a blank on off the top of my head. We've got 20 games since the 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 tenth of December. Wow, that's a lot for a league. No, 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 no. That's not a lot. 20 games in 20 games since when did I start that league? Hold on, let me. You said the tenth, so it's been about nine days. It's been longer than that because it's been like two weeks. Oh, it's been two weeks. Okay. So, I did, yeah, December 10th. So, today's the the 19th. So, it has been nine games, but we've only gotten 20 games. Like, I, I don't really, like, and the, there's, like, a lot of really good prizes. And I've had to play in half of them. Because there's so many people that want to brew this stuff, but don't want to play. And it, it baffles me. That, like, oh. I'm like, you know what? I don't have two hours to help you brew your deck idea that mm -hmm. you're gonna not test. You know, yeah, what? I'm I gonna know. help. I'm gonna help the guy who's jamming a deck. Mm -hmm. Like me and this guy that that I I I've been helping him brew this um Eureka build. It's a hundred dollar mm -hmm. Eureka build. We're on Doomsday, and the deck is clapping. He's also we're also working on a hundred dollar um. Malcolm Tana okay. deck is clapping and they're only hundred dollar decks. And obviously they're designed to play against other hundred dollar decks. Oh yeah. But they're performing very well, mm -hmm. but he's taking the time to play them. And he's like, well, I'm finding these cards to not be that great. And I think we should try that. I'm like, dude, perfect. Done. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? But he doesn't come up to me every five minutes with like a rando idea. Wanting, mm -hmm. want me to spend three hours building it. And maybe I'm just sounding like a grumpy old man, but you know what? You're not the one that gets asked 12 times a day to brew some random ass commander. 
no, I totally get it. Like, I mean, I think that really, and this is something that I think that we all, this is a mentality that I feel like when it comes to brewing, we all need to embrace. Because I feel like a lot of it comes from the fact that people don't want to get in the game, play the card, and then lose because of it, because they don't want to feel bad. But how do you learn really, if you don't lose? Fuck around and find out. All right. Like, like I, I will yeah. tell you right now that, like, I had a thought process, and I know this is going to be a spicy take, and this is something I'm working on, and it, that I don't know if it's true or not yet. It's just a, it's just a theory. If I'm playing Counterbalance in a zombie, why am I not playing Disrupting Shoal? It's free interaction. It is super. It is super narrow. It is, and it's probably bad. But I'm gonna fuck around and find out. I don't know if you should be playing disrupting. I mean, okay, so you're in a mono blue deck. So all right, so let's do the yeah. math real quick. How how many actual blue cards are you playing in a zombie? Oh gosh, I have the deck pulled up really quickly. There, uh, uh, sort it real quick for me. Let, let's do the quick uh, math. So, so for here. those of you at home. Disrupting Shoal is blue, blue, an X. Counter target spell with converted mana cost X. All right. And then it has a clause that you may exile a blue card with mana value X to counter a spell. So you have to discard. The card that you exile has to be the same mana cost as the card you're countering to play it for free. So. From what I am seeing, there are five, there are sixty nine cards in the deck that are blue. Nice. And then another thing that made me think about this was like, well, why am I if I'm going to be playing constructing shoal? Will actually, ever work? You know, because I was like, I don't know. I looked at my curve. My curve is mainly zero to three drops. Like, but two are drops. they blue zero to three drops? Yeah, they're mostly blue zero two and three drops because blue zero, well, the zero the, oh the zero drops uh blue zero drops not that I should say one through three drops then okay zero okay but blue one through three I, okay sorry, I was thinking about counterbalance but like you know it's like it's it's something where I've always been of the opinion that like disrupting shoals too too narrow it's it has too many hoops to jump through but like really after playing a couple of games when I'm playing I'm pitching curse the force full of force negation I'm like. I'm pitching one and two drops anyway. Like you are, but you're. But the problem is, is with disrupting shoal. You, you have mm -hmm. to have the exact CMC of yeah. blue card in your hand. Mm -hmm. So in order to counter an Adnaws, you have to pitch a five drop. In order to counter Dockside, you have to pitch a two drop. In order to I mean, counter for... Timna, you need a three drop. Yeah, and like for Adnausium specifically, it's going to be really awkward because like. You only have force of will, and at that point, weren't you just force of willing pitching something else using yeah, disrupting shoal? Just back cast up? force of will pitch your disrupting shoal, <laughs> right? Yeah. yeah. Oh, I mean, here, you know, this is the exact thought. Like we can talk about this all good why it doesn't work, but let me tell you this: the cards I'm putting in work, it has been overperforming from what I expected it. Really? To. Okay. Yes, because. But, but that's the thing is like part of that is part of that new tech is. Mm -hmm. Is is like we were talking about is like re, like we're not reinventing the wheel. We are we're going in. We're re rebuilding the engine. We're rebuilding the transmission. Yeah. Put new tires on the old girl. Mm -hmm. Like that Oldsmobile your grandma been driving since you were a kid needs oh, love yeah. if you want to keep it on the road. Oh yeah, and it's and like that's how control is right now. <laughs> no, it's for cool. It's it's been interesting. It's been fun, you know. Like I mean, we we're we we're talking about like these cars, like really. Like, we don't need to reinvent the wheel. Like, really, what I did with this thought process was, like, firstly, end step, end step, end step process is fucking around and finding out. I, I use that phrase because I love it. Yeah. Like, yeah. We're just sitting here. We're going back to the basics because we've determined that free slash cheap interaction is good. It now, is. Well, and, what, and, and that's the, so that's the other thing mm -hmm. is, like, so with the Thrasios Timna build that I've been kind of kicking the tires yeah. with is that I'm pl not only am I playing all that free interaction, but then I'm playing, like, like the six best eight bears slash stacks pieces that I can think of to yeah. kind of couple with that. So that's how I'm taking mm. the, the four color sans red approach is that I've increased my wind con density and I've made them all the same wind con. So I just yeah. have th six versions that are interchangeable. I have three copies of console and three copies of Oracle all interchangeable. Mm -hmm. And plus the, um, the P grass 
can count as a seventh of either one most of the mm-hmm. time. And then you 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 have static hate that you can play and play under effectively and is it yeah. like shooting you in the foot like playing humility in a deck that's trying to like leverage creature abilities is a good mm-hmm. example um yeah and then getting all packing it with as much free interaction as possible that's relevant and then yeah. like rounding out that with good card passive card advantage engines pat you know mm-hmm. And and all of these and the right card advantage engines again, like yeah, you know, and and then picking a commander that we can leverage stuff like rich like red rituals with our black rituals or Doxai, J like J Lotus like those types of things to get these guys down fast to get those free spells online. You know what yeah. I'm saying? Yeah, it's. Yeah. I think that. Just in general, really, because you know we've been talking for a long time, and there's been a, there's a tidbit of the stuff we've talked about. Really, the biggest thing I think is just something needs to happen, and I think that the reason something needs to happen is because we keep on brewing, we keep on finding cool stuff. Because I'll, I I I am more than guilty of this. We find a cool card. It says do this, do that. And you're like, wow, this might work. It works a little bit. And we build entire decks around it. And then we move on to the next one in three days because we lose five games with it. Because we Yeah, have... because every every single Magic the Gathering player has ADHD. Well, and <laughs> we do have ADHD, but we keep building the same deck. Yeah. Like, at the end of the day, we're not... Like, Evelyn is a World Gorger deck. She's just a Grixis World Gorger commander. She's great. Mm-hmm. Alk did a good job. Alchemist did a great job on her. But at the end of the mm-hmm. day, like... World Gorger's not new. Oracle's mm-hmm. not new. Reach isn't new. Scepter's not new. Mm-hmm. Swift Reconfig and Devoted Druid isn't new. I mean, I guess it would. Well, Devoted Druid as a combo piece was not new, but Swift Reconfig was a new piece of yeah. time for it. But like, the same, con- the same concept is there. Emil, like all of these combos aren't new. We just keep kind of slapping them into a new package. Yeah. And, and at least for control, no, like, the like the the mentality with with brewing control has remained this has remained antiquated. Like we're we're still like trying to trying to fight rocket ships with horse and buggy tech. You know what I'm saying? Like that, that's really, kind of what I feel like. Yeah, I I really feel like a lot of that is because you know we stole a lot of heuristics from sixty card formats like Legacy, and I think that we've just transported the control heuristics over to mm-hmm. over to commander and nobody's taking the time to go wait a second why the fuck are we doing this this doesn't work obviously well, right and, and not even and also not even acknowledging the inherent disadvantage also yeah i don't i don't commonly hear people who want to play control talk about the fact that they are literally playing commander or multiplayer on hard mode because they are trying to make like i said earlier trying to make three players mm-hmm. Play honest that don't want to play honest and are de incentivized to play you honest because the card pool isn't mm-hmm. built for you to play honest. Like this yeah. isn't block constructed. Like yeah, I mean we're it's singleton vintage. Yeah, like singleton, single. lines eye diamond and dark ritual. We don't it's have a sing- bunch of like they're way better than gray ogres when you got 120 damage to deal. Oh, yeah, that's the other thing. Let's let's not forget the fact that you know our opponents have 120 life. Like when you look at the card pool and the life total, it's like, how are we trying to play honest magic here? Why are we trying to play honest magic here? Yeah, and I don't even think that's about playing honest magic. I think it's about, and I think that it's more about if people aren't playing fair magic, then why are we playing fair answers? Mm-hmm. People who play control, I would like to challenge you. Mm-hmm. Instead of trying to. Play like play broken magic in the same way that your opponents are, mm-hmm. but play control while playing broken magic. You you're, you don't you don't have to be the guy who's trying to go. You just need to have the rocket strapped to your ass so you can keep up. Mm-hmm. So Cole, um, thank you for joining me, very yeah, very much. Thank you for um, having me. 
if anybody wants to send you hate mail for anything you've said today, where can they reach you? Um, you know, I'd really rather not have hate mail, but you can find me on Twitter at Lightning Farts because I'm unoriginal. Um, you can find me at Unmoxfield at Thunder Farts. Um, and then I do have a Discord, but you know, we're going to keep that one a secret for right now because I think that's findable on my Moxfield. It's a, it's a little game for people to try and find me on there. Mm-hmm. If you've made it this far, now you got a treasure hunt. Okay. Exactly. Well, if anybody wants to send me hate mail, I'm Timmy T1000 everywhere. I have a Discord. Um, there's obviously the comments in below this video. Mm, so I'm not hard to find. All the links will be in the description. And everybody, thanks for making it this far, and have a good night. Bye. Cole, say goodbye. I did say goodbye, I thought. Goodbye, everybody. Bye.